The views and opinions of this broadcast do not reflect the views and opinions of Armed Media, Unew Productions and its affiliates. Enjoy the show. Welcome to another episode of Betrayal on Armed Radio. I'm your host, Casey. And um, last week we discussed some unsolved cases there. And this one is really uh, chilling. These are unsolved cases, but they also have um, phone recordings of people calling in to, um, you know, are they voices from beyond the grave? Are they... You know, um, it's just unsolved, you know, voices there. And the first one, um, it's just a real injustice because um, this this poor girl has called out for help many times and people just, uh, I guess, were not able to get to her. Uh, whether she's still alive or not, it's not known. But... I hope you guys enjoy these um, unsolved cases there. And of course, there's news about a case that is was unsolved uh, dealing with a child who went missing on her vacation. Um, there, there's new updates on that. So that's still a, a work in progress um, there. But I'm going to let you listen in to these uh, recordings of and in, in these unsolved cases. All right. Number one. April 6th, 1986. Nine-year-old Anthonette Queadito and her two younger sisters were at their home in Gallup, New Mexico. Their mother was at a bar with her friends, and the three children were being looked after by a babysitter. In the early hours, their mother returned and sent the babysitter home. She then fell into a deep, alcohol-induced sleep. At 3 a.m., there was a knock at the front door. Both Anthonette and one of her sisters were still awake. Anthonette asked who was there. Uncle Joe, said a voice on the other side of the door. Hurry up, let us in, we're cold. Anthonette opened the door. According to her sister, she was immediately grabbed by two men who pulled her into a brown van outside. She kicked and screamed, but could do nothing to stop her abductors. They drove off with her into the night, and for the past 33 years, Anthonette Queadito has remained a missing person. Her real Uncle Joe was determined not to be involved in any way. One year after her kidnap, the Gallup police station received this chilling call. Unfortunately, the call was too short to be traced. When Anthonette's mother listened to the recording, she said that she was sure it was her daughter's voice. It seemed like Anthonette was still alive, though perhaps living a fate worse than death. Her mother didn't recognize the voice of the man who cut the call short. His identity remains unknown. Anthonette's mother died in 1999 without ever discovering what happened to her daughter. The same goes for her father, who died in 2012. Back in 1991, there was one reported sighting of Anthonette, though the validity of that sighting has never been confirmed. A waitress in Carson City, Nevada, noticed a teenage girl that matched Anthonette's description. 
she was with a quote-unquote unkempt couple and continually knocked her utensils onto the floor. Every time the waitress went to pick up her knife and fork for her, the girl grabbed her hand and squeezed it tightly. After the girl left with the couple, the waitress found a napkin hidden under her plate. On it, the teenager had written two messages. Help me. Call police. There have been no further sightings of anyone matching Anthonette's description. If you think it's strange that a young girl would answer the door at three in the morning, then you're not alone. It came to light that numerous people were coming in and out of the Caedita household on the very night that Anthonette was taken. Anthonette's mother neglected to mention that to the police. It makes you wonder who was there and why the mother didn't tell them. It appears that the mother may have had more information about her daughter's disappearance than she let on. She even failed the police lie detector test. It's also telling that the cops paid Anthonette's mother one last visit on her deathbed. Were they perhaps hoping that she might confess something, or reveal some information before she passed away? One other important thing to note is that the Caedito household had a screen door. This suggests that Anthonette may have recognized her abductors. If she didn't, why would she have unlatched the screen? Regardless, investigators believe that Anthonette is no longer alive. They have, however, released this image, showing what she might have looked like in 2013. Interestingly, ten months ago, a Reddit user by the name of Sleuthing Noob came across a Jane Doe file, a police report about an unknown murder victim. The report said that in 1996, a body had been discovered in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Take a look at this description and these reconstruction images. They're eerily similar to Anthonette's 2013 reconstruction. The user contacted the Albuquerque Police Department, but, according to NAMAS, the U.S. Resource Center for Missing and Unidentified People, it's been determined that this Jane Doe is not, in fact, Anthonette. Still, it just goes to show that even after 33 years, people are still actively trying to solve this mystery. Perhaps one day we'll know the truth about what happened to Anthonette. Number 2 Being a police dispatcher can be a tough job emotionally, something that many new operators find out during their training. Learning how to handle distress calls involves listening to a bunch of them, and some, like the one you're about to hear, are harder to sit through than others. This call was made by a woman named Ruth Price and has been used in the training of new dispatchers since the 1980s. Many dispatchers say this is the most disturbing call they've ever heard. What's the problem, ma'am? Oh, well, there's some guy been uh, taking the place out. No. Well, he went in the back. I have an apartment in the back, and he said he was looking for a guy. And he comes to my door. And... Yes. Yeah. And uh, I said he's uh, looking for an apartment. So I'm, I live alone, and I'm an old lady. Mm-hmm. Where, where is he now, ma'am? I don't have no idea. <laughs> 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 Operator? 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 Despite being so prolifically used in dispatcher training, very little information exists about the call. The call is always presented to trainees as 100% authentic. Recruits are always told the backstory to the case, and they're always told that Ruth did not survive the attack. Despite this, pretty much no information about Ruth's case exists online. It supposedly happened before the days of the internet, but you'd think that there'd at least be something out there about it. As one former dispatcher writes, 
In the early 1990s, I worked as a 911 dispatcher in Florida. This call was played for us as part of a training exercise, as an example of why it's so critical to ask for a caller's address before asking anything else. As a result of similar incidents, it's been policy across various police departments to state, 911, what's your location? What little information there is matches up with what I was told in the early 90s. The call was made in 1988. The caller was an elderly woman named Ruth Price. She was killed by a prowler, and the prowler was not apprehended. I'm so frustrated by the lack of any credible information about this call. Because of the lack of information about the case, it remains a mystery whether this call is genuine or just an amazing piece of voice acting. Another former dispatcher is more certain that the call is real. Although there were rumors that this was fake when it first came out, sadly, the recording is 100% real. The recording is used in police training on what not to do during a 911 call, and why you should always get the location or address first. Because of the 911 operator not getting that info and not really taking her seriously, the cops never got out there in time, and the killer was never caught. There's little info out there on Google as this happened way back in the 80s, before the internet or Google existed, but there was a thread posted about it on a police forum back in 2002. I'll try to find it and link it, but from what I remember... I'm pretty sure she was beaten, or bludgeoned, to death. If you scour some online forums, you'll still find people debating whether this call's real or fake. Whatever the case, though, the prospect of receiving a call like this is enough to put anyone off becoming a police dispatcher. That much, I'm sure of. Number 3 July 1974 A man named Bashir Kaujakchi went to pick up his wife from a party in Beirut. His wife was a singer. The venue that she was singing at was known to be a gathering spot for Middle East diplomats and arms dealers. While en route to pick her up, a white van drove Bashir off the road. Several armed men came out and forced Bashir into the van with them. He had just been abducted, and he had no idea why. The men took him to a basement in an unknown location. For the next five days, Bashir was tortured by his new captors. When he told them that he was an American citizen, they accused him of being a spy for the CIA. Still utterly confused, Bashir told them that they'd simply got the wrong guy, that he had no idea who they were or what they wanted from him. Still, the torture continued. He wasn't allowed to sleep and was only fed small meals. He would also hear the tortured screams of other prisoners being held at the same location. Rather than endure his torment any longer, Bashir attempted to kill himself. Using a small piece of plastic, he cut his wrists. Surprisingly, the men holding him hostage actually took him to the hospital and saved his life. After receiving medical treatment, Bashir was able to escape. That was the first bizarre incident in the life of Bashir, a victim of mistaken identity. Cut to 1983, and Bashir had become a successful restaurateur in the USA. His crown jewel was the Marrakesh, a Moroccan-themed restaurant in Philadelphia which his sister managed. While working on the construction of a second Marrakesh restaurant in Washington, D.C., Bashir started to receive some peculiar phone calls. The newly installed landline would ring, and Bashir would answer, but there would only be eerie breathing on the other end of the line. When Bashir installed an answering machine, things began to escalate. Someone would leave messages where they'd just laugh into the receiver while strange noises played in the background. Whoever was doing this had the voice of a child, making the constant harassment all the more strange. As time went by, the harassment got more extreme. 
The caller started threatening Bashir's life and the life of his employees. Machine gun fire and screams could be heard in the background of the calls now. Bashir thought the scream sounded familiar. They were just like the ones he had heard from other prisoners when he was a hostage in Beirut. These were more than mere prank phone calls now. Because of the caller's childlike voice, he was given the nickname L'Enfant, French for the child. For the next decade, Bashir's restaurant would receive an average of 15 to 20 calls a day from L'Enfant. If he travelled to the Philadelphia branch of the Marrakesh, L'Enfant would just call there instead. The mystery caller always seemed to know where Bashir was at any given time. Eventually, things became more serious than simple phone harassment. Bashir's unknown tormentor began tampering with his vehicle, carving stars of David into the paintwork. They even began cutting the wires in his car, which, at one point, led to the vehicle catching fire. Now fearing that his life was actually in danger, Bashir went to the FBI for help. They placed a wiretap on the phone at his restaurant. Over the course of 18 months, over 3,000 sinister calls were recorded. These calls all came from payphones. The strange part, though, was that oftentimes, the calls were made in completely different parts of the DC metro area, but were made within seconds of each other. That strongly suggested that there were multiple people involved in the harassment, and that they were highly organised. Bashir was eventually forced to check himself into a mental hospital. The calls were beginning to take their toll on him, and he needed to escape. Still, Lomfong continued to call him at the hospital. While Bashir was away, Richard, the young son of the Marrakesh's new manager, was attacked by two unknown men. L'Enfant later called to let the manager know that they were responsible. They even spray-painted the words, Richard will die, on their front door. In 1993, the story of L'Enfant was featured on the popular show Unsolved Mysteries. After the episode aired, the calls from L'Enfant suddenly stopped. Perhaps the person or the group feared being identified. Whatever the case... They had made Bashir's life a living hell for ten straight years. To this day, the identities of the L'Enfant callers remain unknown. Who were they, and just how many of them were there? Why had they dedicated ten years to tormenting Bashir? Were the calls linked to his abduction and torture in 1974? And finally, was Bashir simply the victim of mistaken identity in that incident as he had claimed? All questions that remain unanswered. In 2002, it came to light that Bashir was running a website that revolved around homophobia and anti-Semitism. He even published an advertisement for his restaurant containing the line, Have Zionists turned Jewish beliefs into a political party in the service of hatred and greed? That line doesn't exactly scream fine dining to me. People have debated whether Bashir had always held these extreme beliefs, if they were somehow the reason he was targeted by L'Enfant, or whether these views were the result of his mental breakdown brought about by the calls. If you'd like to dive deeper into this mystery, I've left a link to an interesting podcast in the description below. Be sure to check it out after the video. Number four. What uh, what should I do? Gary Subbrink 
a soldier stationed down in Texas, took some time off from his base to visit his family in New York. He didn't tell anyone that he was heading home, since he wanted to surprise them all. While waiting for his flight at the airport, he was approached by a man holding a clipboard. The man began asking him a bunch of questions, like how he spelled his name, where he was going, and other personal information. Gary figured the man was trying to sell him something, so he tried not to pay him any attention. Problem was, the guy was persistent. When Gary boarded the plane to New York, he forgot all about the encounter. Then, just as he was relaxing into his seat, a different man holding a clipboard sat down in the seat next to him. Again, this new guy started questioning him. Gary told him to get lost, but this guy too was persistent. When a stewardess came to check the clipboard man's ticket, she told him, This isn't your seat. You need to move. Luckily, the guy with the clipboard obliged. Two strange encounters for sure, but nothing to worry about. When he finally arrived in New York, Gary went to surprise one of his close friends with a visit. He became confused when his friend didn't appear surprised to see him at all. When Gary asked why that was, the friend replied, What are you talking about? You told me you were coming to New York yesterday. That was strange, Gary thought. He definitely hadn't told his friend he was coming. Gary worked out that someone must have called his friend using his phone number somehow, pretended to be him, and then told his friend about his plan to return home. A weird prank to say the least. Not to mention, Gary didn't recall telling any of his buddies back at the base that he was returning home. Next, Gary went to surprise his parents. It's while he was at their home that he started receiving these strange calls from an unlisted number. Whoever was calling him spoke with a sinister, robotic voice, like they were using a voice changer or something. The robot would ask Gary the same question multiple times, like, how long are you back from Texas? And made weird statements like, you are being impersonated by the other voice. These calls would come day and night. Gary tried talking to the unknown caller. Gary's father tried talking to the unknown caller, but they could never get any information out of it. The calls were so relentless that Gary started recording them. Yes, this is me. Can I speak to you? Can I ask why you're... Yes, can I ask why you're calling? Can I please ask... Yes, this is... Yes, that is me. Say that again? Leave? Hmm. I'm staying right here. Is this a joke or what? second. Yeah, what is your question? I'll answer it. So how long are you going to be back from Texas? How long? You are being impersonated by the other voice. Right. When am I coming back? Is that your question? Okay, there was a break. Hold on. You want to know when I'm coming back to Texas? Oh, is that your question? So how long are you going to be back from Texas? How long am I going to be back from Texas? That question doesn't make any sense. Okay. I'll be coming back eventually. Um, I can't tell you when. You should know that question, the answer to the question, because you seem to know more about me than I do. 
as many have noted. It sounds like the caller's voice is coming from a tape recorder. Every time he repeats something, it's said in the exact same way. And, as Wish I Knew Who points out, you can even hear the whir of the machine as the caller rewinds and fast-forwards the tape. The calls go on for a lot longer than the clips I've played here, with the strange voice continually repeating vague and nonsensical questions. To this day, Gary has no idea who continuously called him while he was in New York, nor does he know what they wanted from him and why they disguised their identity. He also doesn't know who the men with the clipboard were, or how someone was able to inform his friend of his return. What do you think's going on in this one? Your guess is as good as mine. Number 5 I suppose this last one's cheating a little, since it's technically a phone message rather than a phone call, but it's interesting and creepy nonetheless. Four years ago, a Reddit user posted a chilling story that happened to their mother. Worried that the call might be linked to the Nuclear Defense Agency, the user created the post anonymously under a new account. In 2012, the user received a call from their elderly mother. She was calling from her neighbor's house, and she was absolutely hysterical, sobbing about how somebody had taken over her home phone. The user was confused by what she meant, but then again, she was very old. The neighbor she was with checked out the phone, and everything seemed normal, so eventually she calmed down and returned to her house. A few days passed, and then the same thing happened again. The user's mother called them in a state of pure terror. Once again, she was at her neighbor's house, shaking uncontrollably. This time, she refused to go back to her home. The Reddit user took a week off work to stay with their mother. To begin with, the user couldn't find anything wrong with the phone, and figured that the mother was just going a little senile. That proved not to be the case. Over the next few days, the user discovered what was really going on. Every day, between 7 and 7.15pm, a strange message took over their mother's phone. When she lifted the receiver, instead of a dial tone, she'd hear this unsettling message. Outside of that 15-minute window, the phone would work normally. The phone didn't ring at 7pm or anything. It was just that if you lifted it to make a call within those 15 minutes, you'd hear the creepy message rather than the dial tone. If you hung up the receiver and lifted it again, the message would restart. If you hung it up and lifted extremely quickly, the line would appear to be dead until 7.15. The user was able to make a recording of the message. Here's what it sounded like. Connecting you. Please hold the line. NORAD. AWS. Station Zulu Foxtrot 77. Zulu Foxtrot 77. Status alert CON 4. Status alert CON 4. Security tracing in progress. Attention. 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 Whiskey. Whiskey. Zero. Nine. Ready. November. Papa. Four. Four. Danger. Hotel. Papa. Eight. Seven. Ready. Hotel. Quebec. Three. Nine. Ready. Papa. Kilo. Five. Eight. Ready. Foxtrot. Charlie. Two. Three. Ready. November. November. One. Eight. Trigger. Victor. Yankee. Nine. Two. Ready. Lima. Charlie. Five. Six. Secure. Attention. 
Attention. Attention. For the whole day after they recorded this message, their phone line was dead. The phone company said that they couldn't find a fault in the line. That evening, they attempted to record the message again to see if anything had changed, but rather than be met with the strange message, there was just the normal dial tone again. The message never came back. Early in the morning of December 1st, 1948, people strolling on the Somerton Beach in Australia discovered a body lying in the sand, and that discovery launched one of the country's most enduring mysteries. Following an investigation, authorities revealed some of the weird details. The body belonged to a man who coroners said was in, quote, top physical condition. There were no signs of trauma and no sign of how or why the man died, though they believed he had been poisoned. There were also no clues to the man's identity, because strangely, not only was he missing identification, all the tags in his clothing had been cut out. Authorities did, however, find a cryptic note secretly sewn into his clothes, the Persian phrase, Taman Shud, which means finished. It had been torn out of an 11th century book of poetry entitled The Rubiat of Omar Kiyam. The book was later found, and inside was some kind of encoded message using a cipher that still hasn't been broken. There was also a phone number, which turned out to belong to a woman who lived nearby, and who swore she didn't know the man at all. Some speculate he may have been a Soviet spy who was covertly murdered, while others think he was a scorned lover who took his own life. Scientists are hoping DNA tests may soon solve the riddle, but until then, the identity of Somerton Man and the circumstances surrounding his death remain a mystery. In 1959, nine cross-country trekkers disappeared in Russia's Ural Mountains. Weeks later, the remains of their camp were found on the slopes of a mountain named Kolotsiakl, which means dead mountain. What searchers found continues to baffle people to this day. Hikers had apparently cut their way out of their tent in the middle of a terrible storm and run into the freezing night, some not even wearing shoes or socks. Two bodies were found wearing only underwear, while three more were found with massive internal injuries similar to what you'd expect from a high-speed car crash, but with no corresponding external wounds. And perhaps strangest of all, two of the corpses were found to be radioactive. Theories range from an avalanche to secret Soviet military testing to an animal or even Yeti attack. Some even think they were murdered. The truth, however, remains buried beneath the ice. In the 1930s, the remote Galapagos Islands suddenly gained new life when Ecuador decided to open it to colonists. Little Charles Island gained three families, one of which was eccentric indeed as it consisted of an Austrian named Eloise de Wagner Bousquet and her two lovers, Robert Philipson and Rudolf Lorenz. Nicknamed the Baroness, or the Empress of the Galapagos, Wagner Bousquet and her partners lived a bigger-than-life, free-love lifestyle, becoming such darlings of the media that they even starred in a short movie filmed on the island. But the bliss didn't last. On March 27, 1934, the Baroness and Philipson disappeared. Lawrence told their neighbors that the pair had left the island for America after being picked up by a yacht belonging to friends. Not long after, Lawrence himself decided to leave the island and boarded a small boat manned by a Norwegian fisherman. None of them were ever seen alive again. Lawrence and the fishermen's bodies were found months later. The two died of dehydration after being marooned on an island with no fresh water. An island that mysteriously was nowhere near the planned path of travel. As for the Baroness and Philipson, no sign of them was ever found. It's possible they safely arrived in America and lived out their lives in anonymity, but most believe Lawrence murdered the pair and fled to escape justice. Hannibal, Missouri is famous as the home of Mark Twain, who immortalized his childhood explorations of the town's extensive cave system in books like Tom Sawyer. But in May 1967, the town's mythology took a tragic turn when three boys apparently entered the caves and were never seen again. Construction on Route 79 had opened up new sections of an extensive cave complex, and witnesses say they saw young brothers Billy and Joel Hogue enter those caves, even though just the night before, 
The two had been explicitly warned by their parents not to go near the caves. They disobeyed, though, and vanished, along with friend Craig Dowell. A massive search was mounted, with experienced spelunkers joining the FBI to map the entire cave system. But the boys were nowhere to be found. One of the boys' sisters has said she believes the boys went into one of the construction holes on the Route 79 dig and were accidentally buried alive by workers. More than half a century later, the truth still remains elusive. In 1860, an author named Robert Dale Owens published a book called Footfalls on the Boundary of Another World. In it, he recounts the story of a woman named Emile Saguet. She was a teacher in the 1840s who was reportedly haunted by a ghostly doppelganger who would appear out of thin air in full view of Sagay's students and then vanish. At times, this spectral twin would even appear independently of Sagay, showing up once in a classroom of 42 shocked students while the real Sagay obliviously picked flowers right outside the classroom window, which leaves two mysteries. How could this happen? And did it actually happen? The account from Dale Owens was repeated by so many authors that it is now widely assumed to be true. But it seems it had just a single source, a 19th century mystic named Baroness Julie von Guldenstube. So she was just making it up? And if she wasn't, what could possibly explain the phenomenon she described? So far, nobody knows for sure. On February 4th, 2010, Joseph McStay and his wife Summer and their little boys Gianni and Joey Jr. had packed up and disappeared from their home in San Diego. It seemed as they are on the run from people or a situation unknown. Police checked on their home and found no sign of foul play in the empty residence, only evidence of a family's everyday life. Paint cans in the kitchen that they were renovating, a carton of eggs on the counter, and two small bowls of popcorn in the living room. The family's two beloved dogs, Bear and Digger, were left behind in the backyard and nearly 100000 remained untouched in Joseph's bank accounts. He ran a successful decorative fountain business. The family's SUV was found in San Cidro, California, and video surveillance showed a family matching the description of the mixed days crossing the border to Mexico. But outside of that, the case grew cold, and no one knew what had happened to the family. On November 11, 2013, a motorcyclist found their remains in two shallow graves not far from Interstate 15 in San Bernardino County, more than 100 miles from the family's home. They also found a three-pound sledgehammer that they believe was the murder weapon and clothing nearby, some of which had been marked with the same color paint the family had been using to paint their home when they went missing. On November 5th, 2014, after an exhaustive search, California authorities arrested Joseph McStay's business associate, Charles Chase Merritt, in connection with the deaths of the McStay family after discovering that his DNA had been found on the steering wheel of the McStay's car. Prosecutors allege Merritt was a gambling addict who committed the crime for financial gain and wrote thousands in checks on Joseph's business account for days after he disappeared. He remains in jail without bond and will stand trial for the killings in early 2018. Number 9 On September 12, 2009, the body of 51-year-old teacher and part-time census worker Bill Sparkman was found hanging from a tree in rural Kentucky wearing only socks, his hands, feet, and mouth bound with duct tape, an identification badge taped to his neck. Most mysteriously, the word fed was written on his chest in felt-tip marker. His body was found near a small family cemetery in a remote patch of the Daniel Boone National Forest in Clay County. He died of asphyxiation. The death was immediately blamed on local residents with an anti-authoritarian bent, especially given the controversy about political activism group ACORN being involved with the census. While media and pop culture speculation centered on lurid anti-Obama and anti-government conspiracies, the Kentucky State Police eventually determined that Sparkman's death was a suicide. Authorities concluded Sparkman was a cancer survivor, but likely believed his cancer had returned. He committed suicide and staged it to look like a homicide in order to collect a $600,000 life insurance policy, which would go to his family. Officials said that there were no defensive wounds on Bill Sparkman's body, and while his hands were bound with duct tape, they still were somewhat mobile, suggesting he could have manipulated the rope. He was found hanging from the tree, yet was in contact contact with the ground. Number 8 On October 11, 2006, 72-year-old David Lee Niles met with a friend in his favorite hangout, the Jake's Bar in Byron Township, Michigan, and suddenly left. It was the last time he was ever seen alive. 
Niles had been suffering from both cancer and depression, so his family had assumed he'd taken his own life, even putting out an obituary for him in 2011. On November 11, 2015, nine years after his disappearance, a man who was decorating a tree for Christmas outside Cook Funeral Home in Byron Center was able to notice something on the pond while he was on a lift. He immediately notified police. When police arrived, they discovered a submerged car. Inside is a skeletal remain in the driver's seat and a wallet with identification ID card that belongs to David Lee Niles. Meanwhile, if one could have been really curious to find out what is submerged on that pond, Niles' body could have been found earlier after a photo taken by Google Map shows something is at the bottom of the pond. Number 7 In 1999, the new owner of a house in Long Island discovered that a 55-gallon drum had been left outside the crawl space. When the drum was finally opened on September 2nd, everyone was shocked to find the mummified remains of a young woman inside. She was inside the drum for more than 30 years. She had been bludgeoned to death and was nine months pregnant with a male fetus. There were also some personal objects inside the drum, including an address book. This helped police to identify the victim as Reina Angelica Moroquin. She was an immigrant from El Salvador who had moved to New York in 1966 and disappeared without explanation three years later. Investigators were able to determine that the drum had once been used by a Manhattan-based company called Melrose Plastics, where Mara Quinn had been employed prior to her disappearance. The company was owned by a man named Howard Elkins, who was also a previous owner of the house where the drum was discovered. Police used the address book to track down a former friend of Maroquin, who claimed that Maroquin had been having an affair with the married Elkins and became pregnant with his child. Maroquin had allegedly told Elkins' wife about the pregnancy and expressed fear that Elkins would kill her. Shortly thereafter, Maroquin vanished. When 70-year-old Elkins was questioned by police, he was told that he would be compelled by court order to take a DNA test to determine if he was the biological father of the unborn child. On September 10, Elkins committed suicide by shooting himself. A posthumous DNA test proved that Elkins was a child's father. Although it's extremely likely that Elkins murdered Mara Quinn, his suicide prevented the case from being solved conclusively. And there's one haunting final piece that the investigators was able to recover from Reina's address book. It was a small piece of paper that had been folded at the very back page, and it said, Don't be mad, I told the truth. Number 6 On July 17, 1918, after three centuries, the Romanov ruling dynasty fell, ending in the chaos of violence and cruelty. The Russian Tsar Nicholas II, his wife Serena Alexandra, and their five children, Duchess Olga, Duchess Maria, Duchess Tatiana, Duchess Anastasia, and the young Zarevich Alexei were brutally executed by a firing squad in a basement in Ekaterinburg. Because the bodies of the Tsar and his family were never found, rumors abounded that Anastasia, the youngest of the Tsar's daughters, might have somehow gotten away. Two years later, in 1920, a mysterious woman jumped off a bridge in Berlin. Pulled from the Landwehr Canal by police officers after her failed suicide attempt, the unknown woman was soon brought to Daldorf Asylum with no papers in her pockets, no labels on her clothes, and a silent refusal to identify herself. She was given the name Anna Anderson. There she remained for two years. She said nothing at all for six months. Though many took note of her aloof demeanor, the strange scars on her body, and the Russian accent that emerged when she did eventually speak. One day, a fellow inmate told the woman that she thought she resembled Grand Duchess Anastasia. The word began spreading, motivating former Romanov friends and servants to visit the woman and confirm her identity. The press fascination with the story of Anna Anderson grew into a cult about Princess Anastasia. Eventually, she claimed to be the Grand Duchess Anastasia. When Anderson left the hospital, she was surrounded by a herd of supporters who validated her Romanov identity. On the other hand, the true Anastasia's relatives kept their distance. Matters grew heated when the relatives of the dead royal family fought legal claim upon the Romanov fortune in court. The turning point of this royal identity saga came with the evidence that was most certainly not in Anderson's favor. In 1927, a Berlin newspaper had run an investigation report that Anna Anderson's real name 
was Franziska Szkanskowska and that she was a Polish factory worker. Franziska was hurt in a factory explosion, after which she was declared missing. The timeline of this event coincided with Anderson's arrival in Berlin, and moreover, Franziska's brother, Felix, claimed that Anderson was his sister. Anderson refused all these claims, calmly repeating that she was Anastasia Romanov. Anderson died of pneumonia in 1984. Seven years later, in a forest near Ekaterinburg, five bodies were found and matched to the Romanovs. For a moment, it seemed as though the rumors were true. After all, the bodies of the young Alexei and Anastasia were missing, but two other sets of remains were found in the forest later on, and researchers believe these are the bodies of the two youngest children. Using a small sample of Anderson's intestine removed during a prior surgery and kept in a hospital for years, DNA testing done in the 1990s proved conclusively that she was unrelated to the Romanov family. Number 5 On October 18, 1955, authorities discovered the naked bodies of Robert Bobby Peterson, age 13, and brothers John and Anton Schusler, ages 13 and 11. Their eyes taped shut in Robinson Woods Forest Preserve. The boys had been kidnapped and asphyxiated. Bobby had been beaten over the head with a blunt object, and John's throat had been crushed. The events leading to their grisly murder began two days earlier when they had gone downtown with $4 to see a Walt Disney documentary called The African Lion. Later, a bystander who was walking his girlfriend home saw the boys on the east side of Milwaukee Avenue, just south of Lawrence Avenue. One of the boys was standing at the curb, attempting to hitchhike a ride, and the other two were standing in the doorway of a nearby store, taking shelter from the rain. The bystander reported that 15 minutes later, after he dropped off his girlfriend, the three boys were gone. A massive police investigation ensued, but the case ultimately went cold, and the crime remained unsolved for nearly 40 years. In 1994, however, during a federal investigation into the disappearance of Helen Voorhees Brock, the heiress to the Brock Candy fortune, a witness cooperating with the government implicated Kenneth Hansen in the murder. Three other informants later confirmed that Hansen had privately confessed to murdering the boys, based on the facts pieced together by state prosecutors. Kenneth Hansen then 22 years old, picked up the boys and offered to show them the nearby Idle Hour Stables, owned by Silas Jane, for whom he worked. At the stables, Hansen sexually molested at least one of the three boys, then strangled all three of them. Hansen was convicted of the murders in 2002 and sentenced to 200 to 300 years. He died on September 12, 2007, at the age of 74. Number 4 In May 1971, two 17-year-old girls, Cheryl Miller and Pamela Jackson, had planned to celebrate the end of the school year by gathering with classmates at a quarry along a gravel road, but they never showed up. Other teens just assumed they had changed plans. It soon became clear that the well-liked pair had vanished in their Studebaker. For 42 years, their families have waited and wondered what happened to their teenage daughters. Then, on September 23, 2013, someone spotted two tires sticking above the water in Brule Creek near Elk Point. The remains inside were those of Miller and Jackson. The evidence seemed frozen in time. A white license plate was clearly visible, as were the green registration numbers. A watch still had its strap and clearly showed the time it stopped, 10.20. Miller's purse was intact, containing her driver's license, coins, a couple of letters from friends, and other items, all in relatively good shape for being submerged for so long. Those belongings and DNA were used to identify the remains. There's no evidence the teens had been drinking, and mechanical tests on the car did not suggest any foul play. The car was in the highest gear and the headlight switch on the dashboard showed the lights were on. One of the tires was damaged and the thread was thin. Autopsy reports indicate that there's no type of injury that would be consistent with or caused by foul play or inappropriate conduct. The bodies were found in the front seats as opposed to the back seat or trunk and that their clothing did not appear to be missing. What's horrible about this case is that a man innocent of the crimes spent a decade in jail for the murders, all on a falsified confession from a jailhouse snitch. The snitch handed over a tape, allegedly of David Lycan admitting to killing the teenagers, but it didn't even sound like Lycan's voice. Lycan was released and is now filing a 400,000 lawsuit against the state. Number 3 
Nearly four decades after a pregnant woman's body was found on a Wyoming ranch, prosecutors have connected her death to one of the California's most prolific serial killers, Rodney Alcala, otherwise known as the dating game killer, because he was a winning contestant on the ABC primetime game show during his reign of terror, had been charged with the murder of 28-year-old Texas native Kristen Ruth Thornton, who was six months pregnant at the time of her death. Alcala met Thornton in San Antonio in August 1977, and then allegedly dumped her body on a ranch in Granger, Wyoming. She was strangled. Thornton was found in 1982, but her identity remained a mystery for more than three decades. She was finally identified in 2014 after DNA linked her to her sister. Her family recognized a photo of her that was one of several released by the Huntington Beach Police Department in 2010 after Alcala was sentenced to death. The photos were found in a Seattle storage locker owned by the killer. Investigators believe Alcala killed Thornton in Sweetwater Country based on a photo that shows her alive in what appears to be a remote public land northeast of Granger, a short distance from where her remains were found. Alcala, now 74, a former photographer convicted for a string of murders in California, remains at Kokoran State Prison and is sentenced to death. He is believed to have an estimated 50 to 130 victims, but the actual number is still unknown. Number 2 On November 9, 1979, a grisly discovery was made by a passing motorist in a cornfield 20 feet from Route 20, about half a mile from the intersection of Route 5 in Caledonia, New York. A young girl, 13 to 19 years old, was discovered. She had been shot twice with no evidence of being sexually assaulted. Police determined she had been shot in the head with a 38 caliber handgun, dragged into a cornfield, and then shot in the back. A waitress from a small diner in Lima, New York, remembered seeing the young girl with a white male described as being 5'8", 5'9", with black wire-rimmed glasses and a tan shirt. He was driving a tan station wagon with side paneling. Several truckers also called for information about the young girl trying to hitch rides with them to Boston on truck stops. Eventually, the girl named as the Caldonia Jane Doe was later laid to rest with no identification, no way of knowing who she was, let alone the killer. 35 years later, on January 26, 2015, the unknown identity of Caldonia Jane Doe would be solved. She had been identified as 16-year-old Tammy Jo Alexander. It is reported that on November 3rd, 1979, Tammy went missing from Brooksfield, Florida. She was last seen the day after her 16th birthday. Her case filed reads very little, besides the fact she was endangered missing and was believed to be a runaway. A missing person report was filed for Tammy by her high school friend. She hadn't heard from her in years and tried to track her down. When she did, she found out that Tammy had run away years ago and that her mother, who had a heavy drug addiction, hadn't even bothered to report her missing. The classmate reported her worries to the police, who soon realized that Tammy was a Caledonia Jane Doe. However, the search for Tammy's killer is still open and active. Number 1 On 28 September 1995, the body of a teenage girl was found in New Britain, Connecticut. Shot in the head, she had been left in the doorway of a music store in the city's shopping area, wrapped in plastic bags and a sleeping bag. Just one week later, the body of a woman was found 40 miles away in Tolan State Forest in Massachusetts. She had also died from gunshot wounds. Both victims had no identification on them, and all efforts to identify them failed, leaving them nameless and their killer on the loose with little hope that justice would prevail. In January 2011, police released details that they believed the two bodies were mother and daughter, which had been established through forensic testing. This discovery prompted the question that their murders were linked and may have been carried out by the same killer. However, they still had no names for who they were. It was a surprise call to the New York State Police in 2014, which led to the breakthrough in this cold case and the arrest of 70-year-old Robert Haunch. In June 2014, a relative contacted police to report that 53-year-old old Marsha Haunch and her 17-year-old daughter Elizabeth Haunch were missing and to voice their concerns that Marsha's husband and Elizabeth's father, Robert Haunch, may have been responsible for their disappearance. They explained the family had been looking for the mother and daughter since they went missing in 1995. The caller told police that Robert Haunch had told them that he, Marsha, and Elizabeth were moving to Australia to start a new life. 
In 1995, Robert Haunch was living with his wife and teenage daughter in Brewster, New York. Although the couple had separated years earlier, they had recently rekindled their relationship and moved back in together. Little is currently known about Haunch's immediate movements after his wife and daughter disappeared, but by the time of his arrest in 2014, he had married again and had three young children and was living in Dalton, Ohio under the name Robert Tyree. Robert Haunch was arrested and charged with murder in both cases. All right. So, I mean, some of those were very interesting stories of unsolved cases. Some cases were solved. Some are actually still open uh, cold cases. It's amazing how many cold cases there are throughout the country. Um, Does that mean that, you know, uh, with all the the rights that are going on right now with the um, Fergus case, um, and previous cases before that, all the way to Rodney King, a lot of things are coming into question of how effective is the um, our police force, our legal system, how effective it, it is, um, and uh, you know, in solving cases. Now, um, you know, some of the some people would say that if you had money. Uh, your case could get solved quite quickly because they would dedicate time for it. But if you don't have money or middle class or don't have money, uh, your case gets filed away and forgotten. And a lot of people are sick and tired of that. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, Be sure to comment below and let us know what your thoughts are on this whole uh, situation. Is the legal system effective? Does it protect criminals? Um, does it really dispense justice as it was created for or a means of, you know, protecting bad people? Uh, you know, these are all questions. Are police officers really necessary? Uh, are they because a lot of them don't do their job and are corrupt um, and people are questioning all these things right now and they're super pissed. They were super pissed at Rodney King. During that time, they were super pissed, you know, um, in many cases uh, when they protested, you know, they were super pissed. And, you know, as long as injustice happens and and people are still getting hurt, they're going to continue to be pissed off. And, um, you know, looting is not the way to go about for justice, but... um, you know, because I feel like as though they're, what they're looting is, you know, they're grabbing things that normally are out of people's price range. I mean, certainly out of my price range. And, you know, just to go will-nilly everywhere. But um, that's for another show um, all out of time. So, you guys, uh, be safe out there with the coronavirus. Be safe out there with all the protesting and the un- civil unrest. And I will see you guys next week for another tale. Bye-bye now.